And so on we move into our second class on hydrotherapy. And in this class, we're going to be looking at more at the use of water. And the, the treatments that I want to look at now are very simple treatments that you can use for the home. And one that we use a lot for, for headaches at Misty Mountain Health Retreat is a hot foot bath. Especially when we get people coming off coffee. And what you'll find, often when people have a cold, have, have a headache, their feet are cold. And you can't put cold feet into a bucket of hot water. Now the only time I would not do this if someone had chronic cold feet or if someone had peripheral neuropathy. So what would you do then? What you could do is you could put their feet in just warm water. And you could also massage their feet. Massaging will always bring the blood to the feet. But if someone did not have chronic cold feet and they had a headache, then you'd put their feet in, t in uh, warm water and then slowly bring it up to quite hot. And when the feet are in hot water, they are a reflex for abdomen, for chest and for head. And often when someone's got a headache, the, the blood seems to congest in the, in the head. So you put your feet in hot water and now the feet are calling for more blood, it'll go straight from the congested part, which is usually the head. And so a hot foot bath can take the edge off a headache. So you will need to add more boiling water probably about every five, seven minutes so that you maintain that heat for 20 minutes. Now when you're adding boiling water, you always get them to take their feet out and put their feet on the edge of the bucket so that there's no way that you will burn or hurt their feet. And I always put my hand in and uh, engage the temperature and again get them to, to test it. But once you heat their feet up, then they can usually take it a little warmer. You always end a hot treatment with cold. So what I get them to do is get put their feet up in the air and just pour cold water over their feet. What cold does is it equalises the circulation and prevent chilling. And that's why our guests with the steam sauna, they always have the hot steam and then dive in the cool pool or have a cold shower. So you always start with hot and you always end with cold because we're warm-blooded creatures. Again, the only time you would not put feet in hot water is if they had no feeling in their feet, they had chronically cold feet, peripheral ne neuropathy. So I'm going to show you how the hot and colds work. And what, what happens when you first put hot water on the body, you get stimulation. And what you're stimulating is blood. And we want to stimulate blood because the blood's the healer. Remember when you stimulate blood, you stimulate more nutrients, more oxygen, more water, carries the waste away and more white blood cells to the area. So whenever hot water is applied to the body, it stimulates blood flow to the area. After about three minutes, the stimulation changes and it becomes, a, it slows down. And we can liken this if someone has a hot bath and they get into the hot bath and it tingles. It's stimulating. And then the person eases into the hot bath and what happens after about three minutes? Ah, everything slows down. But when you apply cold water, and this is water, this is not cold or warm air, this is water. When you apply cold water, the initial reaction is stimulation. And we know that because some people scream <laughs> when they go in cold water. But it only takes 30 seconds. before 
once cold water is applied before it gets to a slowing down. So the initial response when you apply hot water is stimulation. And the initial response when you apply cold water is stimulation. The difference is the time. With hot water, it takes three minutes to start slowing down, but with cold water, it only takes 30 seconds. So what we do when we alternate hot and cold, we use the stimulating times. So if we want to stimulate blood into an area, we put it in hot water for three minutes. And before it's got time to slow down, then we put it in cold water. And then before it's got time to slow down, after 30 seconds, we take it out and we put it back into hot water. And then before it's got time to slow down, we take it out and put it back into the cold water. So this alternating is usually done three times. After three times, the body can get exhausted. So three times is usually enough. So you would do, so it's far more effective to do alternating hot and colds maybe every two hours rather than do six in a row. Because what are you moving? You're moving blood in a dramatic way. So you can use this alternating hot and cold treatments in quite a few ways. So you could do it for uh, a sprained ankle. So a lady rang me and she said, my daughter, she stood on a rusty nail and it almost went through the top of her foot. She said, I've seen your lecture on poultices and I've got a grated potato on it, but it's still a little red, it's still a little sore. And I said, take the grated potato poultice off and do alternating hot and cold foot bath. And remember, you always put the person's foot in and you watch their face. Is that okay? Is that okay? And if, if it's not okay, if it's too hot, then you put a little cold in. Because once they've had the cold, they can handle a little bit more hot. And so I said, do alternating hot and cold foot bath on this foot three times and then ring me. So she rang me about half an hour later and she said, there's no redness, there's no soreness and she's laughing. So what does that tell me? Where are I? It's not always easy uh, dealing with it over the phone. If she said to me, it's still red and it's still sore, I would say, just, just go to hospital. <laughs> Because I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's happening there. I can advise and then you apply and, and if the body says yes, you're on the right track. And, but if there's not a response, then you might need to go and get help. But I have to tell you, I raised six children in a rainforest and it always worked. <laughs> it always worked. So those hot and colds are very effective for ingrown toenails. And you remember this morning I told you about Chris, the hippie who put a sickle in the back of his heel <laughs> and we did the hot and colds. And I could tell by his body response, great reduce in pain. But I had an interesting experience when I was in Papua New Guinea a, a few years ago. My host took me up to a little village right in the interior where there was no running water, there was no electricity. So it was interesting, we were walking through this little village and at the, in the middle of the village, and it was at the back of, I think, the main house, there was like a little kitchen and it was outside, so they had a fire there and they had a little, like, uh, tin, tin uh, roof and, and uh, posts and that was like the kitchen, I saw the fire there and I also noticed in the middle of the village that there was a like a polypipe coming out of the ground with water and so they'd obviously got into a spring that was their water source and there were lots of people around to see this white lady who'd come and I saw a man holding his hand like this and it had like a dirty cloth on it and the man looked like he was in his 40s 
So I was immediately interested and I said, what's the matter with his hand? And they said he had a hunting accident and a knife went in and it almost went through the other side. So I said, can I have a look? And the man was frowning and looking at me and it was very swollen and just his body language told me he was in a lot of pain. And so I, through the interpreter I said, can I do something that I think will help? Anyway, he was a bit reluctant here, but agreed. So what I did, was what we've got to go, fridge is there, we've got no ice is there, but there was, a, there was a fire with a kettle on it. So I knew there was hot water and I saw plastic bowls. I said, we'll get two plastic bowls and we put a bit of cold in one with a bit of boiling water. And then the other one, we, I just got someone to go and get it out of the spring, so it was quite cool. So we had quite a crowd now. There was like a bench there, you know, in the kitchen area. So I put his hand in hot and I just watched his face. You can tell straight away if the person can handle it. And he, he, he was about 40, strong man, and I could see it was a little bit difficult for him. So I just put a little bit of cold in because what you've got to remember that after they've been in the cold, they can handle a bit more hot. And then I, I looked at him again and, I, and, and he nodded, yes, and, and he could handle that. So how long have we, are we in the hot for? Three minutes. Three minutes. And then I put it into the cold. And then I got the kettle and put a little bit more hot in. And he was watching me put the hot in. And I said, put your good hand in. Does that feel good? So you see, you've got to work with the person. So how long are we in the cold for? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. And then back into the hot and yeah, he could handle that. And then I got someone to empty that bucket with the cold and get fresh cold. Because they haven't got ice, as soon as the hot hand goes in, you see it heats it up a little bit. And the, we had lots of water. So I did this whole thing three times, but, but after the second hot, when he was in the cold, I saw his whole body relax. And I, I could tell that he's getting pain relief. And then I heard him start blah, 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 chatting away, chatting away to all the people. And, you know, at first they were all frowning a bit. They don't know what I was going to do, but I saw everyone relax. But his whole body changed. And I see this, and we'd only done two hots by this stage. And then the third hot, you always finish with cold because cold equalizes the circulation and prevents chilling. And then, so how long does all that take? Yeah, 10, maybe 11 minutes at the most. How long does it take a painkiller to work? 30 minutes, an hour. At least half an hour. <coughs> and I would like to suggest, I could not communicate with him other than sign, but I'd like to suggest that his pain levels reduced by easily 50%, just by doing that alternating hot and cold. Why? Why has that reduced pain levels? Because what you're stimulating is blood. And whenever there's an injury, the blood tends to sit and pool in the area. So when you're stimulating blood, and we looked at this earlier in the week, and we'll just define it. And I'm, we also looked at the fact that the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And it's the life of the flesh because of the nutrients that it carries. It's the life of the flesh because of the oxygen that it carries. It's the life of the flesh because of the water that it carries. And also a very important factor of what the, the red blood cells do is they carry away waste. So when you cause a fresh supply of blood into the area, it pushes the old blood out because whenever you've got an injury, often the blood tends to sit and pool in the area. So you want fresh blood in and you want the old blood out. So it carries away waste. So that's what the red blood cells do. The blood also contains white blood cells. So they're your red blood cells. And your white blood cells, of course, are your internal army. And when we looked at the immune system, we looked at the different types of white blood cells and how their role is to basically engulf and destroy pathogens in the body. So what happened with this hand, you see it had sealed, 
but it was deep. So the white blood cells are going there, they're engulfing and they're <coughs> consuming the, the bacteria that's come there. So, you know, that whole process that happens. But what we have to do is we have to help the process. You see, the body's designed to heal itself. So rather than come in with drugs that kill, let's just work with the, the, the systems that God put into place to bring about healing. I think if I hadn't gone there that day, what do you think might have happened within another week? That man was a poor man. He, didn't, he couldn't get to town. He couldn't get to the doctor, couldn't afford the doctor. Gee, what have we got, blood poisoning? What, what happens after that? Does it, get, does it poison him? Does he have to lose his hand? The end result. And so when, when I'd finished, I um, dried his hand and he is smiling. He's just chatting, chatting, chatting to everyone. What, what I've done is I've greatly reduced the inflammation by pulling fresh blood in and taking the old blood out. And then I said, um, does anyone know of any healing leaves, any plants that grow around here that healing leaves and someone seemed to know some so they went and got them so they got me these green leaves you could actually use any green leaves because of the chlorophyll and so I just squished them in my hand like this to bring the, the juice out and then I just pushed them in that area and I said does anyone here have a bandage someone ran off and got a bandage and we bandaged it up and then I said now we're going to pray and oh, they were very happy to pray because I think they thought that I, I, was, I was like an angel <laughs> that had come into their village because what are they going to do? So many people are sick through ignorance. They don't know what to do. I'd like to suggest that, uh, suggest that 100 years ago many people knew what to do. And I know that medicine, had, well, surgery's come a long way, but the problem is many people have left the old ways and are depending on the drugs, but drugs never cure disease. They might save a life in a crisis, but they don't heal disease. So do I have to say, do I have to um, tell them what to do now? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all, because... They, they have all had a class <laughs> in hydrotherapy. They all know what to do. And it's quite possible that in a few hours that hand might get sore again. Well, he, he knows exactly what to do now, to do the alternating hot and coals and keep the leaves on. And what the hot and coals will also do is they'll keep that wound open. They'll keep it open until it heals from the inside inside out. And how it keeps it open is really just by the flush of blood because that hot and that alternating hot and cold are stimulating blood. And the blood, of course, carries all of this. But another very remarkable story that, that happened was probably about 10 years ago when I was in New Zealand seeing a lady and she had her little son with her. And I noticed her son was standing like this with his finger like this and the finger was twice the size. And I was looking at it, it was all red with like, it was like a volcano, a pussy top. Now when a finger's that big, that's huge amount of pressure, that's pain. Remember, inflammation and swelling causes pain. And I said, what happened to the finger? And she said, it's cellulitis. That's what the doctor said. You know what cellulitis is? Inflammation of the cell. Ah, oh, well, we can see that. <laughs> but I, want, I was digging deeper because you just don't wake up with a finger looking like that, yeah? So I said, but what happened? And she said, well, he had a blister there and the blister broke and he's playing in the dirt with his little matchbox cars. So what's happening now? You see, your skin is, a, is your protection. And when the dirt got into there, then immediately, it's incredible what the body does, it sends the SWAT team on, it sends the, <laughs> sends the army there, uh, swells it with lymphatic fluid to block it a little bit so it doesn't go through the whole body, the white blood cells come into... It's an amazing process. I said... Um, what have you been doing? She said, well, he's on his second course of antibiotics. 
He's having painkillers a couple of times a day and sleeping tablets to sleep. Eesh. Little seven-year-old boy. I said, can I try something? She said, please. So I'd, all I had to do was get two mugs. This is New Zealand, so you don't have to put ice in the water. It's cold. And he couldn't handle it very hot at first, and that's understandable. I got him to put his, his uh, good finger in, so you've got to work with them. He could handle that, put the sore feet, ah, okay, put a bit more cold in. Yeah, you see, you've got to win confidence. Three minutes, then 30 seconds in the ice cold, and I poured a little bit more boiling water into the hot. Yes, he put his good finger in, and I, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Put his sore finger on, I looked at him, I'm smiling. Yeah, yeah, can handle it. I said, yes, good, 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 good. And, uh, and I saw the same thing with this young boy. When he went into the second cold, I saw his body relax. I saw a smile come to his face. By the time we'd finished the three, what's that, 11 minutes, with him I saw easily 50% reduction in his pain. And I'd like to suggest by just looking at his body language, I think he was sort of averaging about 7, 8 out of 10 pain. 10 out of 10 pain is you, you, you know, <laughs> you're ready to scream. It's unbearable. So his body language told me it was sort of sitting at about 7 to 8 out of 10. So I think by the time we'd done the hot and colds, we're coming down to about a 4 out of 10. 4 out of 10 pain is, is very manageable. And then, and this little boy, now he's just smiling. <laughs> and I just grated about a teaspoon of potato because that tissue swelling, if ever you see tissue swelling, you want potato. Potato will reduce that tissue swelling. Even though it was a joint, I knew that most of the swelling was the, in the tissue around. And uh, I wrapped it on and asked God to bless the poultice. And for the rest of the interview, I was with the lady for about another half hour, this little boy just sat smiling. <laughs> when they got home, about two o'clock, the little boy said, can we do that again? Now, why did that little boy say that? I'd like to suggest it's the first time that he's experienced relief in the 10 days since it first happened. So they did it two in the afternoon, they did it, uh, took it off and, and I think by the end of that second one it was right down. And he had his shower, did another hot and cold, another bread of potato. She said that next morning when they took it off, everything came away. Everything came away. So now the finger's back to normal. So this is not even 24 hours. The finger's right back to normal and he's got a little bit of a hole there. Well, you keep it covered. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'll just leave it with him. If it gets a bit sore again, what do you do? Another, another hot and colds. No amount of hot and colds and no amount of grated potato will open that once it's healed. And it totally healed. No need for antibiotics. No need for painkillers. No need for sleeping tablets. So you just target that. Remember? you're looking at response. In the New Guinea story, would it have helped if you had had a pinch of salt in that hot water? Or pinch of salt in the hot water? Maybe, maybe not. Remember, healing comes from the inside. That's where healing comes from. And you know those plastic bowls, they probably weren't all that clean. I don't know. And the cold water, it wasn't sterile, but it's, it's what's happening on the inside of the body. What was interesting when I was in Papua New Guinea, I was there for another hour walking around looking at things and this man was right behind me the whole time. <laughs> and he's pointing to me, pointing, he's telling everyone. <laughs> he was so happy. I'd like to suggest for the first time in many days he had, he had relief. How long did it take? 11 minutes. Hydrotherapy has been used for centuries. In the, in the area of pain relief, it's without equal. It's without equal. So this is actually emergency medicine, isn't it? This is where you get relief very, very quickly. It's very powerful. So you can do it to the 
to the feet, the toes, the ankles. You can do it to the hands. You can do it to elbow. And our massage therapist, Howard, he hurt his knee, strained his knee. So he had two long buckets, you know, buckets that... So most buckets are, are like that, and that's okay for feet. But he got a bucket that <clears throat> was probably like that. And what he did was he had it on the ground and he kneeled and he put his knee in the hot, then his knee in the cold, then his knee in the hot. It's probably a bit, maybe a bit deeper than that. And that's how he did his hot and colds and then he did the uh, uh, castor oil compresses overnight. How do you know which compress to do? Try this one, see what the response is. Try another one, see what the response is. So you, you look at different... Uh, poultices and you just look at different responses and sometimes your body might like them all. might like this for a while, then it, next time it might, might like that one for a while. But remember the castor oil compresses, you can use that same one again and again and again. But using the alternating hot and coals in conjunction with the poultices, um, together they can be very powerful. There's another area that you can use the alternating hot and coals, and that is on the hips, and it's called sit baths. So when a person does a sit bath, they're looking for a tub that they can sit in. Sorry, I'm not a great drawer, <laughs> but he's very happy, and he's sitting in the hot water. So hot water, how long for the hot? Three minutes. And then we have another tub and that's cold. Sorry, I think they're getting worse. <laughs> and this man goes, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so the cold is 30 seconds. And that's done three times. So why would you use that? You would use that for any problem in the, in the pelvic area. So for people with fibroids, for people with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, tomorrow we're going to look at hormones. And it's very important for these growths in the reproductive organs that the hormones be balanced. So we'll look at that. But they can do alternating hot and coals. And again, that's done three times. And then after that, then they can put the castor oil compress on. It can also be used uh, for kidney around the back. It can be used for a man for prostate problems. So it can be used for uh, problems with the endocrine system, the reproductive system for men and for women. It's also very good for hemorrhoids, the alternating hot and cold. And if someone is very thin and the hemorrhoids are quite painful, they can sit on a, a little rubber pillow. You can get rubber blow up pillows like this and they can blow that up and sit that on the bottom and that's quite good. You've heard of fissulas. Fissulas can happen when someone has colon problems, maybe irritable bowel, and sometimes another hole can be made where the feces come out, and that can be very painful, but the alternating hot and colds can bring great relief and also boost healing to the area. But we had a young man attend our program. This is probably about 15 years ago, and I was told about this young man. He was only 14 and he was having accidents in the classroom where, where bowel contacts was coming out. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is for a 15-year-old boy? Sometimes he had diarrhoea, sometimes he had constipation. If he had constipation, he had no accidents. But if he had diarrhoea, he had an accident. Now that told me that that anal sphincter is not functioning properly. He'd already had one operation and it hadn't been successful. You don't want an operation to that area. And so what's he going to do? He's only 14. So he, um, I think he was almost 15 by the time he came to us. 
So what we did was we gave him hot and cold sitz baths every morning and every evening. And I also um, noticed that if you've got alternating diarrhoea and alternating um, constipation, you got some problems in the colon. And he was like some 15-year-old boys, not all, but he loved McDonald's, loved the fast food. Well, that, <clears throat> that, that's just going to irritate the area. And he was so excited at what he was learning because it was a terribly embarrassing thing that was happening to him. In fact, his mother said it's really hard to even get him to go to school. <laughs> So we, ch we told him about the problem with these irritating, devitalised foods. We showed him what food he can eat. He was very, very happy with the food that we ate at Misty Mountain because it was delicious. And uh, when he was going home, he had no accidents with us because he had no diarrhoea with us. And when he was going home, I had to make a program that a 15-year-old boy is going to do. Now, he's in got incentive because he didn't want to ever go through that again, but I have to make it reachable. So I said to him, just do it once a day. Because when a young boy's getting ready to go to school, how, how's he going to do this? <laughs> so I said, and he was about my size, so he could easily get tubs that he could sit in. And he'd done it all week at, at our retreat, so he saw easily how it's done. So I said, just do it before you have your shower at night. So if you're going to bed at 9, you could just do your sit spas at 8.30, takes 11 minutes, have your shower and be in bed by 9. I said, do it for 30 days, non-stop. Our, our cells have memory, so when you're doing a hydrotherapy treatment like that, every time you do it, it extends the potency. So your second treatment is almost as twice as potent as your first. So what's happening by your 30th treatment? It's uh, multiplying. So it has a dramatic effect. And by the way, just consider for a moment what that anal sphincter is doing when it's sitting in hot and then going over to the cold area. It's <laughs> you see, you're getting blood to the area, but blood feeds the nerves. And, it, and the muscles are strengthened with the increase of blood and nerves into that area. So I didn't hear anything else. Often no news is good news. But two years later, no, actually it was three years later because he was 18 when his cousin came and did our program, a girl, and she was in her 20s. She said, did you hear what happened to Tom? I said, no, we didn't hear anything. She said, he's totally healed. Totally healed. And you can't often say that. <laughs> there is often a management program, but this was a young boy and uh, when given the right conditions, he's still growing and, and his body was given the right conditions at the age of 15, it responded well. She said, the last I heard, he was, he was travelling on an overseas trip and he could never have done that when he had this terrible affliction. I had another girl uh, do our program. This, this lady was in her early 30s and she was... Uh, she was a marketing manager. She was a real mover and shaker of a lady. She was married. She didn't have children. She said, Barbara, I've got a little flap of skin near my anus. She said, I don't like it, so I'm thinking of having it cut off. She said, the doctor said it's quite a simple operation. I said, does it cause you any problem? She said, no. I said, well, if I was you, I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> That's a very, very sensitive area. I left it with her. One month later, her husband rang me. He said she's had the operation. He said she's just in a fetal position on the floor, crying all day. She is in so much pain. And she said she's taking painkillers, but what the painkillers are doing are constipating her. So she... I said, bring her in. <laughs> and she certainly needed one of these <laughs> in the bottom of the sitz baths. So we did sitz baths twice a day. We also gave her the herbal tea to soften the stools 
so that that was a little easier. And one easy way to soften the stools is just have a cup of chia soaked in water. That, that makes like a soft jelly. That, that, that's very good at moving the bowels too. She was with us for five days and these hot and goals brought incredible relief, incredible relief. Remember what I said? In the area of pain relief, this is powerful, very powerful. Because of the fresh blood, old blood going out, reducing inflammation. And then at night, we put a poultice on her anal area and we covered that with just like a panty liner. And the poultice that we put on her at first was potato, just grated potato. It's very soothing, very cooling. We had to get that inflammation down. And I think after a couple of days, then we started to put aloe vera. Aloe vera has a growth stimulant on it and it's also very soothing. At the end of the week, her husband came to pick her up and she walked out smiling. <laughs> He said, has anyone seen my wife? <laughs> Just incredible turnaround. Because what was she going to do? What, was she gonna, what, what, what were her options? She could not go back to the surgeon. They, they've taken the flap of skin off. I think what happened is when they cut, it, it cut a little bit closer to the anal sphincter. Oh, you don't want to touch that area. And then the stitches to the area. Ah. I think she was very much wishing she'd taken my advice, but you know, it happened. So, so what do you do now? And it's the sits baths. And also keeping that stool soft. So basically, when she goes home, I just leave it with her. She's experienced, she knows what it does, she knows what to do. But it was very nice to see her have such an incredible turnaround. They're very simple treatment. They take a little bit of work. That's probably the hardest thing is setting them up, having the hot and the cold. Someone told me that you can buy bowls that will actually sit in top of, on top of the toilet. And so you can actually sit in that. But I think to myself, well, that's the hot. What are you going to do with the cold? <laughs> I don't know. But sometimes people will sit in the hot bath for the hot and maybe they'll jump out and sit in, in the bowl that's sitting on the toilet for the for the uh, cold. Now that would work just around the anal area, but if you want to cover um, from the belly button to the middle of the thighs, which you would want to do for uh, problems inside the abdominal area, then, then you'd, then you'd want deeper buckets to sit in. Where it can be difficult if someone's a little larger, then it's very hard to sit in the hot and cold. So what some people have done is they have a bowl of hot water and a bowl of coal and towels and then they'll just put that to the air. It's not as effective but it is something that can be done. So the alternating hot and coals, as you see, is a powerful treatment. And the SITZ bars, S-I-T-Z, apparently that's German for SIT, in the alternating hot and cold foot baths. What about the spine? What about the chest? How can you do alternating hot and colds there? Well, that's where you can do fomentations. And how I first did fomentations, because I had Dr. Kellogg's hydrotherapy book. And I'm up in the rainforest, and sometimes kids would get colds, and sometimes kids would um, uh, need the hot and colds to the chest. So what I did with my little boy Peter, I told the story of how he got, um, how, how he had asthma. Um, how are you going to do it to a, an 18 month old? It's very, very difficult. So what I decided to do, I sat down and I sat him with his back to me and I had a pile of books and I had one of the children sitting there holding the books up and I put a wet washer on his chest and a hot water bottle. And I put the hot water bottle on the, which was quite hot, but I had the washer touching his skin, so the hot water bottle's not actually touching his skin. And then I put a blanket over there. And then we read lots and lots of stories, his most exciting fire engine books and all of that. And we did that for three minutes, then I took it off. 
and had the cold water. And when we did the cold water, we all laughed and giggled and made, made a big song and dance about how wonderful and cute and ticklish this was because you've you got to work with them. This little boy's only 18 months old. But he was getting so much attention. All the kids were there, you know, they were all doing everything they could. And when, when the children have seen their little brother so sick, you know, it, it helps them to cope with grieving the sickness of their little brother to help, to help in some ways. And as you'll see tomorrow when I talk about children, one of the best things you can teach children is to be little helpers and that they feel good when they're helping. So we did that three times and that was quite a task to have him sit there. But when a child is older, and you could, it, it depends on the child. Some children you can work with easily. I know Peter, I could do anything to Peter, just anything. But with his next brother, William, he was a little bit more delicate. So you, you've got to work with the, the, the personality also of the child. But my children were wrapped up from a very young age, so they were, you know, in all sorts of things, so they were... So they were used to it. And you know what I say to the person who's attending the child? Always smile. Even if you're worried, even if you're concerned, you smile. You know what the smile says? Everything's okay. Everything's okay. And so I remember my daughter, Jessica, when she was about 10, she had a very congested chest. And so I decided to try the fermentations on her chest. And of course, at 10 years of age, they're a little bit more cooperative. And I always explain exactly what I'm going to do. So I had a bucket of boiling water and I had a towel and I wrapped, the, I, I folded the towel so it was like long and thin and I dip it in the hot water and then I twist it. And I keep the ends dry so I can hold the ends. You could put rubber gloves on. And then I pull it out of the water and I keep twisting and pulling and twisting and pulling. So you see what I've got now? I've got a very hot towel but I've wrung most of the water out and then I lift it up so that it's folded over maybe <clears throat> into four and it was maybe folded into eight when I dipped it and then I put it on the table and I wrap it, I, I fold it over a couple of times the, the size of the chest so it's very very hot, it's almost steam and then I put a dry towel on her chest, little dry hand towel and then I put that pack, that hot, very hot pack, onto the towel and then I cover it with a blanket and I watch her face very clearly. All right? All right? It's too hot. So you pull the whole thing up and you get your hand and you wipe the moisture off the skin and then you put it down again and you watch the face. Okay? Okay? It's too hot. Pull it up. And then pull that moisture off the skin again. Put it off the skin again. Remember, she's got that dry towel, but that steam's going through. Put it down. And usually you only have to do that a couple of times. OK, now? Yeah. And then we hold it there for three minutes. And then you take that off and you discard that towel because you're never going to get that towel that hot again. And you know the towel on the chest that was dry but is moist now, you discard that. And then... You have a bowl with cold water and you've got to dip it usually a few times, dip it again, dip it again, till you've done that 30 seconds. And remember, smile like a Cheshire cat the whole time. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, then they can handle it. See, they're, they're looking at you for that. And then you dry it. And then I just put a dry towel over that. And that can just wait a few minutes until I've got my next one. And dip that around. And sometimes, if you've got that on for three minutes, in that last minute, you can be dipping your next towel. Because when you wring it, wring it, and then fold it up, you can roll that up and it'll stay quite hot. And if you do that, of course, then as soon as you've done the cold, dried it, put another dry towel, and then put the hot pack on, and then cover that with wool. And again, you watch very carefully. Everything good? Everything feel good? Yes, 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 yes. It's a bit hot. Pull it up and wipe that moisture off. I've never ever burnt anyone doing that. But what happens is you're, you're dealing with steam now and that steam goes through and it opens the bronchioles, especially with asthma. Now do you remember I said in a steam sauna 
If they breathe in steam, that can irritate the bronchioles to close them a little. But if you're doing it on the steam on the outside and it goes through, it actually opens it. It has a different effect. And my sister, who used to get asthma, she rang me one day when she was 20 and she said, Barbara, what am I going to do? I'm in, a, I'm in a really serious asthma attack. So I put your, put your husband on and I told him exactly what to do. And you have to be very careful, must be the dry towel, and that must be replaced, you know, you watch carefully. How long does it take? It doesn't take long at all, especially if the last minute you've got your next hot pack ready. But she was so stressed out, they went into a hospital and they were sitting in emergency. And while they're sitting in emergency, she looked at her husband and said, actually, I'm feeling good. <laughs> that that this, this hot and colds that you would do on the chest, that, that can bring relief for several hours. It's that steam that opens the bronchioles. And that's what Ventolin does. That's the drug they usually give asthmatics. But Ventolin, one of Ventolin's side effects is that it reduces lung capacity, which you don't want with an asthma attack. So those hot and colds, and also I talked about when we looked at respiratory, Buteyko's method of breathing, of breathing in and out through the nose, holding the breath, raising the carbon dioxide levels, and that also dilates the bronchioles. So my sister, not until she was at the age of 40, discovered Buteyko, and she no longer uses the, the, um, the Ventolin at all. So it's just finding ways that you can do it. Those hot and cold alternating packs can be very good on the spine. If someone has a, a sore back to do, and it's exactly the same thing, you put the dry towel on, then put the hot pack on, then cover it with a woolen blanket to keep it warm for the, thir for the three minutes, and then take that off, that can bring incredible relief. So not everyone <clears throat> has the towels and will dip it in the boiling water. What a lot of people do now is I'll get a towel, wring it out, fold it up to the size they want it and put it in a microwave. And, they, and so there is a use for the microwave after all. <laughs> That's for your hot packs. And once it gets in a hot pack, you can roll it up and cover it with like a little woolen blanket and that will hold its heat until you get it maybe to the next room and then and, and put it on that area. So that can be used on chest, can be used on spine, even could be used on abdomen for someone who's unable to do the alternating hot and cold sit spas. So the alternating hot and cold, you can see why they're such a powerful treatment. Yes? Just wondered about thermophore. Using a thermophore for hot and cold. Thermophore. It's like a heating pad, but it's a moist heating pad, so it pulls moisture from the air and it and it will get some steam. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so I, I guess yeah, that could be used. So when our guests do their steam bath, it's like their whole body is in the hot. <laughs> and then their whole body is in the cold. But it takes a little while for their whole body to get hot. So often they're sitting in the steam bath for maybe about 10 minutes. I say to people, just stay there as, as long as you can. So you've got your alternating hot and colds, you've got your straight hot foot baths that are usually for a headache. And sometimes if someone's very, very cold or very stressed out, the hot foot bath can be helpful. If they're very cold, of course, you start with warm water and slowly, slowly build that up. And if someone's really stressed out, you put their feet in hot water, it calms them right down. Yes? Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate, and Epsom salts is we get our guests to rub Epsom salts on their skin in the second steam bath. And because magnesium is a water hungry molecule, when they rub the Epsom salts on them, it pulls more perspiration out of their skin, which is what we want because the perspiration has the waste. The skin also absorbs some of the minerals, or you know, the magnesium. Plus, the crystals have an exfoliating effect. Now, there are two main muscle relaxants. One is hot water and the other is 
magnesium. So people, if they've got cramping muscles, maybe they, they can have a hot Epsom salts bath before they go to bed. People with restless legs, cramping legs, that often can help a lot. So Epsom salts can be used like that. Yes? My mother used to put mustard plasters on our chest. Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? <clears throat> the mustard plaster, I guess, brings the blood to the area. And you bring more blood to the area. You bring more of all this to the area. I guess that's how the mustard plaster worked. We didn't put coal on. We just put the mustard plaster yeah. and let it cool off. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Vinegar or something in mustard? I'm not sure. No, I've never used mustard. But it's, I, I am familiar that they did used to use that, yes? So what, what wasn't another question? Yeah. Um, can you use this also for, for sciatic nerve problems? For sciatic nerve, it's a pinched nerve. And so you really have to deal with that <coughs> pinched nerves. But there is a way you can lie for sciatica that brings relief to it. So we've got three pillows here and we've got three pillows there, or something like that. And then the person lies, so here's their head. So you see there's the back of their head. So they're lying face down and so their body is like that. Oh, sorry. The <laughs> Okay, that's a foot, in case you're <laughs> wondering. Sorry, but <clears throat> so that's their that's their belly button. <laughs> I think you get the idea. And of course what that does is that causes the the vertebrae to release, which can release the sciatica nerve. I've just got to rub that out very quickly because it's such a bad picture. <laughs> but I think you get the idea and that, that's one way to bring relief to sciatica. It might be an idea to visit a chiropractor or osteopath and, and have them look at your spine but also we can do so much for ourselves by strengthening the core. Have you started doing your push-ups? If you can't do push-ups, start on the wall. Ladies, you can do ladies' push-ups on your knees. So, um, any advice for uh, you give any advice for anyone that had like low oxygen during COVID? Yeah, um, close the mouth and breathe only through the nose. You breathe only through the nose and you can get so much more oxygen. A lady rang me and she said, um, she said, my mother's in hospital, this is in Canada. She's having struggle breathing, she's got COVID, we took her to hospital. They want to put her on Ventolin and give her, um, give her that drug that makes the kidneys fail, Remdesivir. And I said, get her out of there as quickly as possible. They said, what will we do for her breathing? I said, get an oxygen cylinder and whenever she needs a little bit extra, just get, give her some oxygen. Put her on juices, do the natural treatments. Do you know when they rang me, they, the doctor had told them that she, would, she only had five days to live. This lady was in her mid-60s. Mm -hmm. So they got her home. They, they got the oxygen when she needed it. But you can get so much more oxygen by breathing low, slow and deep and breathing only through the nose. When you high press chest breathe, <laughs> Like this, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide, so the oxygen can't be picked up for the cell, and you can have too much oxygen in your blood, but it can't get into your cell. So you force yourself to nose breathe, and you breathe with the abdominal muscles. That can do much to increase the oxygen. And when you breathe with your abdominal muscles, you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your calming, calming. And often when people get uh, think getting breathless, they can get uh, <coughs> anxious and high breathe and then the, the, whole, the whole thing just escalates. So that's a very simple thing you can do. Our time is up. So I'm going to say a closing prayer. 
Father in heaven, thank you so much for what you've taught us tonight. Thank you so much for bringing to our attention the old ways, the old ways that I would say our probably our great-great-grandparents used to do. And definitely the American Red Indians were very famous for these simple natural treatments. We know, Father, that they may become more and more important in the days and the months and the years ahead. Help us to have confidence in you that you made this body, that you gave us the water with, and you gave us the body with its inbuilt ability to heal itself. Thank you for hearing our prayer, Father, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.